Hello, my name is Wai Yin. Um, I'm a software developer. So if I use words that make sense to me, but doesn't make sense to y'all, just let me know and I will find another way to exp explain it. <laughs> or John can help me explain it. Okay. Um, so well, let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, so we are on the data transformation chapter. Um, first thing about data analysis, you have to know whenever you are analyzing data, it rarely comes in the format you need. So you will have to do something to, before you can start analyzing it. You have to do something to the data to put it in the form you need. So in uh, Tidyverse, there's this package called Deep, deep layer that is made specifically so you can manip uh, manipulate and change the uh, raw data into something that you can use. And it's, and like I said, deep layer is part of the tidy universe. So if you want to install it, you can install the entire tidy universe, or you can just install the, the library itself. And the data set that the book uses was from the NC uh, New York flights in 2013. So you need to, if you haven't done that, you need to install and load it. And there's various ways where you can just quickly browse the data. We learned this, but you can just type in the name of uh, the data set that in one of them was flights. You can use view, which if you run it in our studio, it actually, uh, uh, Oh, I need to run this stuff first. Yeah. Install library. Yes. You can use the uh, down arrow on the yeah. block that you're looking at, and it'll load everything before it. Yeah. Um, so if you use view, it shows you in this um, in a format, kind of like a spreadsheet format. If if you don't want to look at this format. And you can also get information about, because as you can see, some of this year, month makes sense. What's depth time and scheduled depth time? If you're not sure, you can use the viewer, um, the help, and question mark is the shortcut in our studio to open the help menu. So question mark and the name of any uh, function where will give you the help menu. So here it actually tells you what each of the columns, columns mean. And so we've gone through that. And when you load a data set, sometimes you just want to do a quick check of what's in it so you can get the number of rows. So we know, okay, there's over 300,000 rows, the number of columns, which um, there's 19 columns. Um, there's two ways to get columns actually, length or any col, or you can use dim just to get both the number of rows and columns. And you might also want to get the column names, which you can do with call names. And that's just like a quick sanity check of going, is this data what I actually need? If, if this looks completely wrong, you're like, okay, I don't want this data set. Go, go to somewhere else. And that, then another thing we do is comparisons and logical operators. So for people who took basic math, you should be familiar with most of these, like greater than, less than. Um, in math, it's one equal sign, but in programming, it's two equal signs when you want to find equal. Not equal is um, exclamation part, not equal. So you can do it with numbers, um, do comparison with numbers, which I, just, I think. I want to slow down on that for a second because exclamation point, um, you know, as a programmer, you're used to that meaning not, yeah. but that might be new to some people. And just to, to call that out, um, it's a very useful uh, operator to to understand because you can use it um, not just in not equal, but you could say like if you type not true or exclamation point true, that means false. So if you display exclamation point something that will evaluate to true, that will give you false. And so it, it just it really works as not throughout pretty much anything you're going to do. Um, all right. And here's comparison with numbers, which um, most of you should be have already seen before. Um, and here's the one tricky part where you, you need two equal signs to go 
do these equal each other? And then you also have the not equal signs. Um, so these two do not equal each other, which is true. But something that you can do in programming that you can't do in math is compare string characters or characters. And here it's it tells you it's false because um, they're doing it, they order it by alphabetically. Um, but so you can do comparisons with strings. Like they said, A equals B, nope. A is um, smaller than B, true. And case matters when you do comparison with characters. So A is smaller than B, uh, is greater than A, nope. Um, A is smaller than uh, uh, uppercase A, which is true because in the ordering, um, for R and, and in other language, lowercase comes first, then you get the uppercase. And just a, a quick warning on that, depending how your personal computer is set up, that the, the um, what's called collation, which is like the settings for your language and alphabet can change these. Like in some alphabets, the lowercase letters come before or come after the uppercase letters. In which case, the all of these definitions would change. Um, so mostly, it's if you see something else, don't freak out a lot, but be aware that that means that your computer is set up differently than the standard that they used for the book. Yep, and because some there are times when you will do need to compare. You won't compare as a letter, but you might want to compare two two words, and you don't want to deal with cases because you don't know if it comes what case that people will type in so you would use um there's two commands you can do lower which turns any uppercase the whole string into lowercase so now this says um lowercase a and the lowercase version of the uppercase a are equal which is true because this converts it to the uppercase a to a lowercase and two upper will tran will transform the string into the uppercase version. So now this says uppercase A equals, the uppercase version of lowercase A is equal to uppercase A, which is true. Um, and there's also logical comparisons. Instead of comparing just one thing at a time, you can compare multiple conditions. So the ones you have are and, and it, it means that um, all conditions must be true in order to return true, this one um, straight bar, which is on, at least on the Mac keyboard, it's right above the return. That's not the letter L. There's a, I don't know about other keyboards, but on my keyboard, it's right above the return. Yeah, um, it tends to be in that same spot between return or enter and um, like backspace. Or Do you know what that character is called? Um, so often it is called the pipe, but then there's a different pipe in R. Um, but the it's the pipe character. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to to talk about because it is it's a bar that looks like a pipe, so people call it a pipe. Yeah, yeah. Just no, don't. Quick, quick question about that: Is that a, a bash thing? Like, do you know? Mm -hmm. Is what the pipe, that that symbol, or it, it is used in uh, Bash. I'm okay. not certain what you're asking, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm just wondering so, where it comes from. Given that R has a different, you know, a, a lot of programming languages use it to mean or, but yeah. some things do use it because it's called the pipe. They use it to pipe one command into another command. Got it. Okay. Uh, so that's the two meanings that it can have. But in R, it means or. Yeah. Okay. And, Great. And Thank I, you. Yeah. In other languages, they also use the ampersand to mean and and the pipe to mean or and exclamation point to mean not not. So it's not just R, but R uses that too. I think so it is it's purely for visual reasons, because if we look at the true or true, true or false, like that bar just kind of visually looks like you know, you're separating them by a, a dividing line. Um, and so I, I do find it, it's a pretty good uh, choice of a character to use, in my opinion. Um, so for instance, if you have true and true, 
um, because you have the and and it will return true. But you have a true and a false, it will return a false because the and everything has to be true in order to return true. For the or, it's it has to be one thing has to be true and it will return um, true. So true and true will return true, and true and false will return true because there's one true. And that's the difference between the and and the and the or. Um, negation um, it will turn a true into false and it will turn a false into true. So if you negate true, you're saying not true will return false. If you do a not false, it will return true. Now, if you have two of them together, not not true, it comes back true because you go, you negate it once, which turns it false, and then you can negate it again, and it turns it back into true. Um, reason you would actually want to, this, why would you ever do that? Um, because, um, let's see, for instance, you want to get this is looks weird, but you can turn it a number or, or string into the Boolean version, which sounds kind of weird right now. So I wouldn't worry about it. But there just wanted to point out there is a use case of doing double negation. If you need I could also it. see it happening, not like right in a row exactly, but where you have like not and then some big expression that also has a not in yeah. it, and so logically it works out to be as if you typed not, not true. Um, yep. yep. Um, so more comparisons, like we learned last week, you can assign objects with the assignment character. So we're saying this object A will be equal to one. This uh, object B will be now five. So now you can compare objects with numbers because um, word A is one. And is it smaller than uh, three? Yes. And you can do all the other comparisons. And you can also compare the objects directly. So is A smaller than B? True. And do all the other comparisons. And then you can combine the comparisons and the logical operators. So now you're doing is A smaller than three and B is, uh, I mean, larger than three and B is larger than three. And that's false. Um, because A is what we did, what we did here was A was one and B was five. Um, so now you do the comparisons and then and then but then if you go if we use the or is A larger than B or B is uh, larger than three, then it returns true. Um, and here's a version of the um, not characters. A equal to B, well, that's false. But then if you not it, now it comes back as true. So um, this comes, th this, says, this, you probably won't write stuff just like this. You have to combine this with other functions to make this useful. So this is just showing you for people who haven't had to deal with this yet, just showing you various ways that you can play with the true false. Okay. And filter is when you actually need all the stuff that was on the previous slide. Because <laughs> with the filter command, what it does is it lets you pick um, certain rows inside your data that you actually want to examine. And filter will only return the rows that evaluate to true. So the first argument for a filter is the data frame that you want to look at, and then the rest of the um, arguments are the um, uh, expressions that you want to do it. And you need to use both logical um, com and comparisons to do it. So let's do the flights again. We know there's over 300,000 rows and 19 columns and column names, um, to, just to get the column names. So I want to get all the flights from November. So this is saying, Give me all the, get, look at the flights data set and return only the rows where the month is 11. And I know from the, and you can pick any of these columns to do the comparisons with. So now I get back only 27,000 out of 300,000. So you, 
it's off it's helpful to like print out the results whenever you do a, a filter just to make sure that it did something because sometimes if you if you get back 300,000 you go okay whatever I thought I was trying to do didn't work because the data didn't change which happens sometimes especially when you're learning you go why isn't it working okay what I tried to do that didn't work at all so it's always good to do like a quick check of does the results look semi okay and then you thing, can also yeah just one thing i really like is uh for the filter command r or uh dplyr has a error message specifically for the case where you accidentally type equals instead of equals equals it will explicitly tell you um did you mean equals equals? And so it doesn't like, cause there are cases where that would be valid. So it doesn't just like automatically fix it for you or whatever, but it, um, it, it, it knows to watch for that unless you know that that's probably what you did wrong. And I just like find that very helpful cause it's a very common typo. Yeah. And in other languages or other libraries, they don't offer that. So you just have to get a read a, a huge error message. And you're going, I'm new. What is all this supposed to mean? And, you're, and, and it was because you accidentally used one equal sign instead of two equal signs. So that's how our art is trying to be helpful. Our deep flyer is trying to be helpful. Give you a common error. And just to, to clarify, with one equal sign, you would be saying the argument month is 12. And filter doesn't have a month argument. So it doesn't know what to do with the month argument. Because single equals, is that's what that would mean, like we saw last week. Um, but it says, mm, well, month isn't an argument to this function, but it is a column in the data set. So did you maybe mean equals equals? Um, and so it, it has some logic in there to figure these things out. Yeah, let's see what it does. Yeah. Let's see the error message real quick. See, it gives you a nice short error. It tells you use, you use the wrong one. So listen to R. <laughs> and change it to double equals. Um, and then you can pick stuff, select flights from December, or you can select flights that are not from December, which would mean anywhere from January to November. And that has th like 300,000 columns or 300,000 rows, which sounds sounds okay Then that, because the total was 370 or something or 330, so that sounds, Okay, and here's where you would use the or things. Um, so you want any all the flights from November or December, and then that would be um, fifty um, thousand, which sounds right because when you did just December, you got back thirty thousand, and when you did November, you got back about thirty thousand. So that sounds about right. Um, and then right. I, I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate you pointing out thinking about it like that because it's an important skill to have when you're looking at data of just constantly be thinking wait does, does that make sense um, both because you can catch errors that way but you can also catch huh I guess that does make sense but that's surprising so I should point that out to whoever I'm doing this analysis for or I should keep that in mind when I'm doing my, you know, whatever your next step might be. Um, so it's useful to explicitly think about, wait, th is that what I expected? Yeah. Yeah, especially when you're new, because there will be times when you type the wrong thing. So you're expecting this and then your results is totally different than what you expect. Then you, you might look back on what you typed and go, did I type this right? Or was, did I use the wrong syntax? Did I use the wrong function? Cause it, cause it, it, this, the, the, at the data I'm getting back doesn't make sense to what I'm expecting. It's completely off base. Um, and here's the thing where you could, you could put, um, use the or to go, I want everything that's either in November or the first day. So you get back that. Um, and then if you, that this is the difference between or or an and. If you use an or for this, you're gonna get back everything from November or the first day. But if you use an and, you would get back all the flight that is on November 1st. So here you only get back less than a thousand, 
versus this one, you get back 38,000. Um, so this is where your sanity check of your data makes sense. You go, oh, okay, this does, that sounds like too high of a number. Maybe I used the wrong command. Um, then you go, okay, let's try the and. And then you go, oh, right, this is what I actually wanted. And this ha happens a lot, especially when you get more complicated comparisons. And then you go, you use the and instead of the or, especially when you use the not, because then you go, is this not false? Or, and it gets confusing inside your head going, and you have to not, and then you have like three or four different conditions you're comparing it to. And then on one of them, you mess it up. So like check the numbers and go just as a quick check to make sure it, it kind of makes sense to you. And one thing um, um, Diplier does is that um, if you want to use the and, you can either explicitly put the and, or you can just use a comma and it will automatically assume. Um, if you list multiple um, expressions, it will automatically put the and. So as you can see, both of these will give me November 1st with 986 because it converts that to an and statement. Um, and um, one thing is this does not change deep learning when it does all your filters, it doesn't actually change the original data set. So when you um, do this, where you go everything from November 1st, the original data set's flights is still, still contains the 300,000 records. Um, it, do, it doesn't contain 986. If you want to save your results, you have to assign it. So now um, you, you assign it to something that makes sense. So I called this object November 1st, so, or November 1. So now November 1 will, is, that only has the 986, while flights, the original thing, still has 300,000. And let's see, missing variables. Um, oftentimes in data, um, when you look, like, look at, at spreadsheets, you know that sometimes the cells don't have a value and that's usually blank. But in, um, in our data frames, instead of just having a blank, um, what they actually will put is this NA value, which means not available. Um, but that's what it means, like if you, more and more used to spreadsheets. Um, instead of a blank, you have NA. And the issue with NA is when you try to compare it with anything else, it always comes back as NA. Even if you compare, does NA equal NA? It comes back NA instead of true. And that's just, um, uh, you just have to remember this. No matter what you do, what try, whatever you do to NA, it will come back NA. The That's only, just to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the only way you can check for NA is you have to use the special um, function that's called is NA, and then that will return true or false. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, the reason that NA doesn't equal NA, you know, it's, it returns NA is, you can think of NA as unknown. And if I have one unknown value and another unknown value, those aren't, we don't know if those are equal to one another. So that's why it comes back with, I don't know, maybe NA. Um, I don't have an answer to that of whether they're equal or, or anything else like NA divided by two. What is the result of that? I don't know. So NA, all of these, you know, all of these cases come back with, I just, I don't know. Um, versus is NA, you're basically saying, is this an unknown value? Um, yes, it's an unknown value. And then you can also um, <clears throat> um, um, by default filter will exclude NA values. So if you want NA values in your filters, you must add it as, as an expression. Um, so right now I'm creating a data frame called a tibble is basically a special version of the data frame that comes from um, tidyverse. So I'm basically creating a, a data frame with three with the column name X and three values. What the values are one and eight and three. And if I just use filter, um, I want everything greater than one, um, it will return uh, uh, 
just one um, value, which is the number three. But if I wanted to actually return NA, I would have to tell it, return NA and pick all the values greater than one, and then you can get NA back. And that matters if in case you want, do care that there are um, rows in your column that just don't have a value in case in your analysis that matters. So you can still filter and return the NAs if that matters in your analysis. Um, a range is another function. Um, and this I mean, changes. I have a, a quick question, sorry. Um, so what is a tibble? Is it just like a, a tiny data frame, a subset of a data frame? It's a specialized data frame. Um, okay. We'll cover it more later in another chapter okay. that has, okay. has some more functions than, than, the base, than the base R data frame. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's basically just a data frame that they have some specialized rules around printing mostly so that you get this nice layout that um, we have on the slide here. Um, oh, okay. There are a couple other things about them, but they're basically just data frames. Yeah. Okay. Another command is range, and a range changes the order of the rows. So you would pass to range a data frame, and then um, all the, uh, co the column names that you want to sort by. So the default order is to uh, uh, um, sort by ascending, which is small to big. And then if you want to go from big to large, which is called descending, you would have to pass the, uh, this uh, function, the des, des function. So for instance, we want to sort all flights by the, the, the departure delay. And this will um, sort it from small ascending, which is you know, small to large. So as you can hear, see here, um, the departure is now sorted for small, and then we go to large. Eventually we get into positive numbers, but this only shows the first 10 rows. And to sort it by descending, you would have to use the descending function here. And as you can see, now you get uh, the departure delays are now in descending order. And you can also sort uh, by multiple columns. Here we're sorting by the year, the month, and the day, which unfortunately you can't see too much now because it's right now it's uh, we're all seeing January 1st because we only see 10 columns. But if you look at further, you will see, yeah, that are being sorted. Um, I think I can show that. Oh. I can range rows with a range. Yeah. So this one is the ascending. Like this is the first 10, but if I go to like 100, still, uh, then you'd see other numbers. Um, but, okay, so an range also puts the missing um, values, the NAs at the end when you sort it. So here I have one NA and three, and when I sort it, it actually comes back as one, three, and then NA comes last. So all your NA values will be last. Um, the next uh, function is to select, and select lets you pick which columns you I want a, to. I have a quick comment about the, the range function. Yes. So remember when you were talking about filtering um, values, and sometimes you want to do sign to check? I, I normally use the a range, especially if you're working with a large data set where you can see all the values. So you can use a range in combination with the filter to kind of confirm that you did get the, the values you are, you are looking for. So for example, when you were filtering on the month of 11, you could um, combine with your range as well. And the next step to see you only have 11, you can use a range descending month mm -hmm. or ascending month or vice versa, yeah. It's a really nice trick, actually, especially if you have a really large data set. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, um, when I'm looking at data, we'll, we'll throw in a ranges just so I can see if it, 
you know, again, if it makes sense, if it has what I expect to be there. Um, yeah. So good tip. And okay, for select, it lets you pick which column. So you pass in the data frame and which columns you want to use. Um, like I said, first, let's look at the column names because who remembers this offhand in your head? No one. So <laughs> that could just a quick way to look at your column names. So now, instead of seeing all 19 of these, I only want the year, month, day um, back. So here you see um, all 300,000 flights, but now I only see um, the year, month, and day columns for it. And another way you can write this is using this um, colon um, symbol. It will pick um, all the columns that start here and end here. So if you look at your original um, columns, that means I'll get back year, month, and day with this um, here. So I didn't have to write the word month, but it's included because it's, it comes between year and day. So it's helpful if you have lots of columns and you're too lazy to type all of them, but they have to be consecutive or in the original data frame for the, this to work. And then, this, if you use this negative symbol, it means pick everything except for this. So, you know, year, month, year, colon, day means year, day, month. So now this is saying return every column except year, month, and day. So now we're, we're going to get back 16 columns because the original had 19 and we're excluding three. So that gives you 16. And just to, to break in for a sec that um, colon is another one of those that it can be helpful to have a word for it. And in R, colon basically means like through, like year through day. Um, if you say one colon 10, that'll give you an array or a, a vector of the numbers one through 10, um, things like that. So through or two uh, is what that one tends to mean. And there are also other helpful functions you can use with select. To, um, in order to select, select columns, like you can pick with starts with, you can, which means pick all the columns that starts with dep. So now it returns two columns because there are two columns that starts with dep. Um, you can have ends with. So now we're at asking, we want back all the columns that ends with delay. And in, the, in, this, in this particular data frame, there's two of them that ends in delay. And then now let's say we want back all columns that contain the contain depth. So it can it can come in the start or it can come in the middle, it can come in the end. It just has to contain that. And in this case, it comes back with three columns. And then this matches is a regular expression. Regular expression is this programming thing where it lets you search for um, a words, but instead of typing out things, you look for a pattern instead of particular words. So what this is saying is, I want to find something that starts with a, it has a character, it could be any character, it could be a number, it can be any alphabet, it can be any punctuation. And then the next thing is R. So in this case, it will um, return back arrival time, arrival delay, and air time, because Air and ARR both match this pattern of starts with the A, anything else, and R. And regular expression is another thing. It's totally separate to learn at some point, but I wouldn't worry about it too much right now. But it's it, it there is a thing that you can use in the programming world where it allows you to fancy more fancy searching. Um, so yeah, I, I just. Um... There's a lot more on regular expressions in chapter 14, yeah. although it still doesn't go into like a lot of detail. And it's one of the, th the things that um, as you need it, you'll, you know, if you work a lot with text, um, you'll get more and more into regular expressions and you can do all kinds of crazy things with regular expressions. Um, I just want, I'm sharing in the chat a site that I use a lot where it just lets you in a web interface, put in some stuff, type in regular expressions, and it'll show you what it would select. 
um, and it has lots of tips in it and how to how to uh, select things. So if you need them, they're there, but we don't need it quite yet. Yeah, so it's there, but you can also forget about it for now. Just go. There was something somewhere that lets me search with wild cards, but I don't remember it. But you don't have to remember it until you need it. I think um, you can. Uh, the, the matches help a function. You can. Uh, you can be lazy a little bit if you don't know much about regular expression. You can still use, like for example, looking for columns with partial matching. Um, you can just type in the first few characters of the column name. And the, the good thing about the match is hyper function that I like is that you can you can supply multiple um, text string to search for um, separated by the pipe. That means, so for example, say I wanted to look for columns that start with A R R underscore, and then another one I don't know B I underscore. You can you can provide both of those separated separated by the pipe, and mm -hmm the code will return all those columns using the partial matching. Yeah. Yep. Which is really helpful actually, especially if you have a lot of columns to, to work with. Yep. So learning the basics of um, regular expression is helpful, but it can get very complicated. And um, so I wouldn't do a deep dive right now. But, um, and you can also, in case you have column names that are basic that start with the same thing, but then end with numbers, which sometimes people do that, um, you can, um, or end with something else, you can use this num range thing um, to do it. So you basically tell you the, the start and then um, the number range. So this goes, I want everything that starts with one and then it goes to three, because I actually have four columns here, X1, X2, X3, and X4 but I only want columns X1, X2, X3, and that's what this num range does here. Um, so it only returns those three. And rename is used to um, uh, rename columns. For instance, if the, and the format is passing the data frame, the new name and the old name. So like, if you don't like this word tail num and you actually want to put a underscore in it, um, you use the rename function and now, oh, unfortunately, it's not shown here because it's actually <laughs> away. But if you uh, rename, um, let's see, I have to go here. Yeah, um, tell num is the name of the column now instead of the original, which was um, just one word. And they just mentioned this in the book. If you want to put some columns first, you can name those columns first and then put everything. And then everything will just you, um, figure it out, all the rest of the columns and put those in the original order in case you really care about the order of your columns. And then the uh, other uh, function you need um, a lot is mutate, which basically adds a new column based on values of existing columns. And the data frame will include the existing columns and the new columns. Um, so for instance, I want to create, um, first I'm trying to um, use select um, to, to create a data frame with only seven columns. Um, and the seven columns are year, month, date, anything that ends with delay, distance, and air time. So now that I have this new column, I mean, this new data frame, I want to add three more um, columns. I want to add a gain column, an hours column, and a gain per hours column. And I use the existing columns to calculate those values. So now I get back a, once you do the mutate, you get back a data frame with um, seven col oh, 10 columns, which were the original seven that I use select on, plus these three new ones, um, gain hours and gains per hour. And transmute is kind of like mutate, um, where you add a new column based on values from the existing column. The only difference is it only includes the, the new columns. So 
this function, which is basically the same as this function, except I put transmute instead of mutate, this will only return the new columns of gain hours and gains per hour. And there are various functions you can use to, to mutate, um, you can pass to mutate in order to calculate these new column values. Um, you can use, you know, the arithmetic for, uh, functions that you are familiar with, like plus or minus or multiply. You can use um, things like sum or mean, um, integer divid modular arithmetic. Like I haven't done math, so I had to figure out what does this mean the first time I learned it. Because, but if you know what modular arithmetic is, then it's available. If you don't, mm, you could learn it and then figure out if you need it. The the percent percent is uh, useful more often than you would think. Where you you just want, um, for example, if you want to find uh, odd numbers or you want to divide things up into two groups, you can just take whatever the ID percent percent two, and then either if it's a if it's an odd number, the remainder would be zero or would be one. If it's an even number, the remainder would be zero, and so you can use that to just assign things into two groups. Or if you want three groups, you do percent percent three percent percent four and that way everything can get like evenly divided into uh, not exactly like ordered groups um mm -hmm. there are other ways to do that but that's a, a way that i use it a fair amount of time so, and sometimes you would do just want to know is this an odd number is this an even number so that's a way to do that yep and other functions are like you get your log functions you get Leading and lag values. Leading means the next value, lag is the previous value. And you can get uh, cumulative aggregates, like you can get the cumulative sums and products and means. You can also do all your logical comparisons and various rankings. Like I wouldn't have to memorize all these, like, because if you don't need it, why memorize it? But just to know that there's a lot of things you can do with mutate. And if you ever come across the case of going, okay, I need this, I wanna add a column and I need it to do this. Um, you can uh, either go back to this book and kind of look, oh, these are some of the things I can do. Or you can do a Google search of, of how to, um, you know, do some kind of mathematical operation um, and see if R comes with functions. because can. Because in theory, yeah, you could write your own cumulative sum function if you had the time, but if it already exists, why rewrite it? So that's why it's useful to figure out what functions already um, exist. Um, and this this one was just um, transmute, and I did all use the various arithmetic functions and just an example of that. Um, so like I used the modular, the arithmetic logs, offsets, cumulative sum, you know, logical and ranks. And I, and as you're learning, it's awful, often useful to do this kind of thing where you're like testing each function just to see what it does. Cause you're, you read the explanation and the help you go, okay, I don't actually, that didn't actually make sense. So you just actually use them and see, okay, what does it return? Because I read the description for lead and I was like, I don't know what that means. And then I printed it out and then you look, because this was duration. And then you, here's the duration column here up oh, this one. And then you put it in the lead and then you go, oh, it returns the next value. That's what it does. So as you're learning new functions, you can plug it in and just try. Try it and see what the function does. Um, and the next thing is um, grouped and summarize. Um, summarize will take the entire data frame and create a single row based on certain criteria. So in here, I want to find of uh, the flights, which, as I said, has 300,000 rows. I want to find the mean of the departure delay. Um, and, we'll re and when I do this, at first, my results is NA. And that's because uh, 
these aggregate functions, like I said before, if there's an NA, it screws stuff up. So it has one NA. So now the entire average comes back as NA. So in order to, if this happens to you and your return is NA, then you need to specifically pass in this command, which is NARM, which means remove all the NA values and you set it to true. So now when you try to find the mean departure delay, it actually comes back as the number you expect. And then it's common to use summarize and group by together, which is basically you group um, the, the, the data sets, you, um, all the rows, you create groups of this, and this tells it, um, <clears throat> I want to group them by each day. And then, and then you could calculate the mean so for each day. So um, here we get back 365, which sounds right, because there's 365 days in a year. Um, I want to uh, interrupt and scroll back a little bit um, okay. because there was a comment in the chat, and I think it's important to mm -hmm. kind of think about why it is that way about the na.rm equals true, that by default, it's false. And if you go back to what I was saying of that NA basically means unknown. So when you say I want the mean departure delay, if you have any unknown values in there, you don't technically know what the average value is. And so R makes you explicitly say, well, yeah, I want the, the average of what I know. But by explicitly telling it that you want the NARM, you're saying, I acknowledge, I know that this isn't truly the, you know, population mean, or even it's not even necessarily the mean of the sample, it's just the mean of what I know. Um, it does get annoying. And a lot of times, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, of course, I just want to get rid of the NAs. But it, I think it is a good exercise to put yourself through so that you, number one, you notice, oh, some of those values don't, or some of those rows don't have a value for departure delay. Huh, why is that? You know, can lend you lead you down paths for that. Um, anyway, that's all. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually that's that makes sense now. Um, <laughs> thanks for that. You're welcome. And the reason why it's NA departure delay, it means okay, if it, no value, that means the plane was on time. That's one thing you can assume. It, yeah, maybe because I think there are some zeros in there as well. Yeah, so, so. that's <laughs> one way. <laughs> yeah, but you can check the data more. Um, yes. that reason. But if there's a column that comes back at NA that shouldn't, like destination, every flight must have a destination. <laughs> so if it's missing the destination, something's goofy. Um, so you might examine the, the goofiness in more in depth to figure out how bad is the data. Because right. sometimes people, you will get data sets or, that are truly screwed up. And if they are truly screwed up, don't use it because then all your analysis will be wrong. Yeah, th that is something that, um, I don't know, like books like this don't go into that sometimes a step for cleaning up the data is to go talk to the person, you know, the people who are collecting the data and number one, ask them, hey, what does this mean? Uh, this doesn't, you know, why are there missing values here or what does this column mean? And then sometimes see, hey, can you maybe actually collect the departure delay or the arrive, you know, the destination on all of the flights? Because I can't do anything with it if you don't tell me what this data is. Um, and so it's it's useful to to realize it's not always, um, you know, as uh, someone working in R, it's not necessarily your task to clean up every possible thing in the data. Um, I've been having to go through this at work that we have some some people on the team who are like, oh, I can figure this out, kind of. It's like, yeah, but uh, we need the actual value. <laughs> we need the team to give us the data that is the real thing, not spend all our time trying to figure out what it should have been. Um, so it's, yes, it is useful to think about that. Yeah, and if you there's a column you're trying to analyze, but like 90% comes back NA, you're like, okay, maybe I shouldn't use this data set. Because then your, your data is going to be really, your analysis, when you're ignore, ignoring 10%, 90% of the rows, then your analysis will not be, you know, the best. So this is where you have to, it's not just about programming the commands. It's going, does this make sense? 
am I doing, should I be doing this? I can do this. I can do an analysis using only 10% of the of the available roles, but should I be doing this? And if you shouldn't, you need to talk to the people who are providing you the data going, this data set's too messed up. And then figure out how to either unmess it up or find a new data set. Um, and then you can combine multiple functions with the pipe. So um, this does the same thing as this, but this I had to write two separate things where first I group by and then I assign group by to a object and then summarize that new object versus the quicker way is to use this pipe command and it will say, take this and then pass it on to this function. And then whatever the results of this function is, um, pass it to the next function. So this um, flights group by, it will um, group, group by it first, then get the results and then pass it to summarize. So it's just about making your code more readable. And uh, uh, this is one of the, the main ones for my quest for making or knowing how to read code out loud is the pipe is and then. Most of the mm -hmm. time, if you read it as then and then, it'll make sense. So take flights and then group by year, month, and day, and then summarize with delay, blah, 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 blah. So, and then. <laughs> and then here you can um, counts, like I mentioned before, you can count the number of um, items in each group, and you can use this as a sanity check to, to make sure, does this make sense? Um, here we get the flights that were not canceled, and then we want to group by the tail number, and we want to get the average delay and also the, how many um, flights are in each group. And then you can also um, do that. And you can also comply, uh, deploy it with ggplot, which we already saw earlier. But just remember, deployer uses this as the pipe, as the and then versus ggplot, which uses plus as the and then. So you do have to switch. So now we, we take the results from the plotter, we filter it one more time, and then we uh, and then we plot it. So this is what it looks like. Um, and then with summary functions, there's a whole bunch of functions. I'm not a statistic, statistician, so I didn't know what some of these meant, um, but that's okay. I, you can use the help. Um, menu to look these up. But one thing that I did like was this counting, um, which is you count by groups. Um, so instead of like the longer way to write it is first you would group by destination and then you want the count because we want the number of flights per destination. That's one way to do it. The sh count shortcut just lets you pass in count and destination and that will return the same thing as the, uh, the, ca the counts per destination. So shortcuts are fun, less typing. And the um, thing I really like, um, I can't remember if he talks about it in here, but count has an argument sort. So you can say count by destination sort equals true, and it automatically sorts or it, it applies a range from um, largest to smallest to the end column. So it wraps yet another step all in there. And a lot of times, Either you want to see the ones that are the highest or the ones that are the lowest. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's nice to be able to, to do that. Oh, what was that? Um, sort? Yes, sort equals true. Um, sort equals true. <laughs> true. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It pasted funny, but R, I guess. Yeah. You have the extra R at the end of the count. Yeah. There it is. See, I forget. Did I function that? No, nope, not yet. Let me just do flights. All the flights. Object flights not found. Flights. I think it's flights. There, yeah. <laughs> so now we get the counts sorted. So, yeah, if you do this false, Come back unsorted, or you can just not 
leave off the word false. Yeah, by the, the, uh, the default is false. Yeah. 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 So, but by the way, does anybody know if the, the difference of using just a T instead of the whole word true or the it's, true? It's fine. Um, it's one of those where it, it it's easy to like lose it in, you know, it's not, it doesn't stand out as much in the code. It's fine to do it as just a T and just a not F. Um, but like for readability, people tend to, well, it depends. Certain groups tend to type it out. And there are kind of these two camps in R where one group is like the real um, quick, clean, uh, efficient code writing. And then the other side is more, well, yeah, but humans have to read this code. So let's make the code really um, expressive and um, don't worry about making it as short and sweet as possible. I, I don't know, like it depends on your, your task, which one it would be the right thing. And the TNF really, it's not that hard to remember, but um, so yeah, the, the quick answer to that is, yeah, they're exactly the same. Um, Okay. I don't know. It's very, you know, it's hard to search for a T, whereas it's easy to search for the word true <laughs> would be one thing. <laughs> well, since uh, true and false, they, they are synonymous to one and zero. Uh, can you use one and zero? <laughs> <laughs> you can, yes. Um, that can start to get even messier. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, like technically, uh, Zero means false and any other number means true. Yeah. And so you could, if you really wanted to, you could use 527 and zero, <laughs> but I recommend true and false. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like you could do that, but should you do this? Mm. Yeah. Say no. That would just go, why? Why? What is happening? Why am I sorting my 99? <laughs> When there are times when that makes sense. So let's say you're trying to say, um, I want to sort this if there is at least one row in the flights data set. And so you'd say sort equals n row flights. Now, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense in this exact context. But if you think about that, that means if there are zero rows in it, that returns a zero, which is false. And if there's at least one row in it, it returns a one or more, which is true. You could also say, you know, and row flights greater than zero, but it's just, that is getting into that whole, you know, can short, efficient, concise code versus code that actually makes sense when you read it. Um, I, I recommend the word true. <laughs> I guess the bigger point here is that R is very flexible and that's actually kind of beautiful. Code yeah. On the programming that languages. That, it, that is a funny thing that in Python, um, there's like a whole rule that there should be exactly one way to do anything. And if you are trying to like introduce something that it's, oh, it's uh, easier to remember way to do blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, 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 because there's already this other way to do it. And yeah. I mean, that's not a crazy idea. Like having a lot of ways to do things makes it kind of hard. Like sometimes you'll be reading code and you you're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. I, I would have done that this other way. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, R is more big on the flexibility. And um, you know, if you find a better way to express something, sure, go ahead and add that in your own package. Um, yeah. So different philosophies. Um, and like they said, um, if you do a numeric functions, it was in book, it will, this is how you could convert. True is converted to one. And false is converted to zero. So if you do sum, which is true, it comes back one. If you pass an expression that it, we will evaluate to true, it comes back one. But if you do false, it comes back zero. And they did that with this um, reason they did that with the summarize command is that if you pass sum to summarize, it will actually return the count. Um, the count of true values. And if you do mean, gives you the proportion of true values, which at first sounds weird. So it's just one of those things you have to memorize that, okay, if you wanna get the counts, this is how you could do it of true values. But the reason why it works is because it's actually, when it, 
um, does this part false comes back as zero and true comes back as one. So that's how it's able to do this weird stuff down here of the counts and the uh, proportions. And like, uh, this is so useful. Like mm -hmm. I use this all, all, all the time. Uh, the mean of some, some true or false value just to find out, you know, what percentage of students take more than 10 minutes on this question? You know, that'd be exactly this kind of thing, mean of time elapsed greater than 10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that just gives you, you know, exactly what uh, what we're seeing here where it's a um, proportion. It's yep. very useful. Yep. And then you can also, um progressively roll up summaries, which was in the book, which means you could do this parts by part. And then first you get the flights by day, you get the number, and then you pass that to another thing. Then you can do the, the number per month. And then you can then do flights per year. So you can break up your function if you don't want to use the pipe thing. Um, but so you just have to be careful. like. For some, it works, but for other things like medians, it won't work because you're actually changing, the values will change. Um, so you just have to be careful. And ungrouping, I haven't used this, but it's available. So if there was a group and then you need to get back to the to the ungrouped version, you use this ungroup thing. I, I will say if you have, um, if your code is behaving strangely, a lot of times it's because you have a hanging group in your data and you you don't know or you didn't realize it was there so throwing in an ungroup will just clean up your groups um the reason that would matter is let's say we were doing a count but if you know we wanted to count um uh destinations but we were already grouping by uh departure cities then that would create a count by departure city and destination and you, you know, it's not at all what you expected to see. So you throw in that ungroup to get rid of that grouping by um, departure city, mm -hmm. for example. You can also fly, like go back to the original flights <laughs> and- Well, and yeah, but it might be in some long um, yeah. process, for example. Yeah. yeah, but there's various ways. That's why you should always keep, it's always helpful to keep the original um, copy of the data somewhere so that if you're getting something really weird, you might have to do rerun this step-by-step -step again. So don't change your original data. Um, and then you could also use group. First, we did it with summarize, but you can also use it with mutates and filters. Um, there was lots of examples in the book and they got complicated for me. Um, but so I would say, yes, you can do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, th and it's, it's, it, the idea is if you need to analyze your data in a certain way, there are ways to do it. You just have to find, you just, you have to use a combination of these verbs of grouping and mutating and selecting in order to do the analysis you want. Cause the, your, the original data set, well, you need to change it in order to do your analysis, which is basically what all these things are, say are saying. So that's it for me. Sorry, we went 10 minutes long. Any other questions, comments? I just wanted to say, uh, don't apologize because I didn't even notice that it was long. It was a very good run through. So, I mean, I guess do apologize because other people might have places to go, but <laughs> thank you. That was really great. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you so much, Wayne. And thank you, John, for the very um, insightful comments all along. Thank you. All right. So I, um, I'll, I'll take it to the Slack, but please, if you are interested in presenting on the, um, the scripts chapter or um, whatever it is next week, uh, the uh, yeah workflow scripts, mm -hmm. um, I would love to have someone do it. If not, it like I say, it's a nice short chapter. Um, it could be one that makes sense for me to walk through because I've got more experience with our studio. Um, but if someone wants to do it, that would be great. And just ping me on Slack. 
And with that, um, anyone have anything else to say real quick? All Just, right. I know oh. these were lots of commands. So the only way you're gonna get better is through practice. So either do the practice exercise or if those sound too boring, pick a data set that you're interested in. For instance, if you were a big fan of the Olympics, go grab the Olympics data and do some analysis of your own so that you can learn these commands. Because unless you, you, the only way you're going to get better is through practice. For sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. And with that, I'll see you all next week. Okay.